Welcome to the groundbreaking news program that delves into the heart of Mormonism, your weekly window into the unique intersection of news, history, and culture that resonates with the tapestry of Mormonism. So whether you're tuning in from the heart of Utah or joining us from around the world, your favorite news program starts now, where news meets insight and the stories of our faith unfold. Good evening, everybody. This is Radio Free Mormon here on the Mormon Newscast. Today's date, March 25th, 2024. I am joined by Rebecca Biblioteca and Bill Real. Good evening, both of you. How are you? Good evening to you. Glad to be here. We have got two main stories to cover today. And the first one is going to be one that I will be covering. If we have that first uh, slide, the stories will be the Jody Hildebrandt Brad Wilcox meeting. Number two, the female priesthood social media storm. Rebecca will be covering that. And then new data intersecting LDS and LGBTQ will be covered by Bill Real and Eastern Mormonism. We'll finally have something that I think will be hopefully lightening the mood by the time we get out of this, because this first, this first story that I'm covering is horrific. I've got to tell you, I've been going over the video and everything that's been released. Uh, let me go ahead and let's go through the first couple of slides here. Uh, here's Jody Hildebrandt and Ruby Frankie, for those of you who don't remember who they are and what they look like. Ruby Frankie is the former star of YouTube channel 8 Passengers, where she had over 2 million subscribers at one point, being a mommy vlogger and talking about family issues and how to run a family that's practically perfect in every way. Jody Hildebrandt, a prominent Mormon social worker and therapist, became Frankie's business partner. Both were convicted by guilty plea and sentenced in February, that's last month, to four consecutive sentences of one to 15 years in prison for child abuse of two of Ruby Frankie's children, a 10-year-old daughter referred to only as E and a 12-year-old son referred to as R. Now, I hear this talked about as 15-year sentences. Actually, these are consecutive sentences. So if you take the four counts and add them all together, what you have is a range of four years to 60 years is really what they're looking at. Four years would be the minimum, I think, that they could serve. And 60 could be the maximum. And uh, uh, as to how much they're going to serve, I expect they'll be up to a parole board at a later date. Ruby Frankie's two children were at Jody Hildebrand's house on August 30th, 2023, when Ruby's son, R, 12 years old, remember, escaped and ran to a neighbor's house for help. The emaciated boy had duct tape on his ankles and wounds all over his body. Police were called, who went to Jody Hildebrand's house, and inside found Ruby's 10-year-old daughter, also emaciated, in a closet. It reportedly took law enforcement hours to coax the girl out of the closet. Now, before I go to the next slide, I want to let you know that I know that lots of people have been covering the story because last Friday, the, um, the prosecutor's office released, let's say both Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt were arrested that day and subsequently pleaded guilty and were sentenced. Last Friday, law enforcement released previously unpublicized evidence in the case, including video, audio, photos, and journal entries detailing the horrific nature of the abuse. As I say, I know a lot of people have done uh, podcasts. It's certainly been on the, the media of the videos, photographs, different things like that. And I was going to cover this for the newscast. And I thought, what can I do that might be different and not just be duplicative of what everybody else has done? So I thought, let me try and find access to this journal which I was able to find online. I read through the 60 page journal or 60 pages of journal of Ruby Frankie. Some had entire pages redacted by law enforcement, by the way, but a lot of, a lot of it is not redacted. And I read through it. And I'll tell you, I have seen a lot of bad things in 34 years practicing criminal law. This stuff is among the worst. It is chilling. And I'm going to go through several of those pages, really about 11, 12 pages total of this journal. And I had about 30 pages that I was going to read through because there is something about just sitting down and reading this journal 
that really brings the impact of the horror of what was going on with these children home, to me at least. And I want to give you a warning right now. If you want to just stop watching this now and come in maybe 20, 30 minutes later for the other stuff, I totally understand. This really has impacted me reading it, and I expect it will again as I read it tonight. But what had happened is that these two children were no longer at Ruby's house, the Ruby's children. But because they were deemed to be disobedient and unruly, Ruby had taken those two children and moved them to Jody Hildebrand's house. And that's where they were at least as early as May of 2023. The boy finally escapes and gets away on August 30th of 2023. And this journal covers what was going on during that time period. But that's why things fell out the way they did, because they were actually staying at Jody Hildebrand's house. And this journal not only inculpates Ruby Frankie in what she was doing to her own children, but also inculpates Jody Hildebrand in these activities as well. And as, as others have noted, it's probably because of the existence of this journal that this went to a relatively quick guilty plea and sentencing the way it did. All right, going on here, journal entries. The first one, and this is the first page, actually the first page is completely redacted. The second page is this page, which is largely redacted, but has some interesting points on it as well. May 21st, 2023 is the first journal entry. Jody receives blessing from Temple President Steve Kaplan. Now, I believe that's the Temple President of the St. George Temple. We have a picture of him here. There's the Temple President, Steve Kaplan. This was a picture that was on the church website from when he was called as a mission president a few years ago. And this is who Jody Hildebrand has a meeting with or received a blessing from. Going back to the same timeline, um, on May 22nd, Ruby... A, J, R, and E, they refer to the children just by one initial, come down to Jody's to help spring clean. 528-23, meet Jeremy Joggy, or it could be Yagi, depending upon if it's pronounced that way. J-A-G-G-I. He is a general authority. Then there's a redacted part that goes up until June 13th is the next entry, where it says Jody goes to Salt Lake City to meet with Jeremy Yagi and Brad Wilcox, okay? And here's Elder Jeremy Yagi, or Joggy. He was sustained as a general authority, 70 of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on April 4th, 2020. And the other person she met with? Well, there's Brad Wilcox. And if we can get my face out of there, I'll just be a disembodied voice if that's all right for a moment. Brad Wilcox, a man who needs no introduction, the young men's general presidency counselor. She's meeting with him, and we don't know why they're meeting. We can only speculate as to why they're meeting. But the one thing that we can, I think, lay to rest and should be laid to rest is that Jody Hildebrand is meeting with senior church leaders at the same time as she is abusing children in horrific ways. And what we need to lay to rest is that there's any kind of spirit of discernment in the LDS church, because there simply is not. And that language and that doctrine needs to be stopped at this point. And if it's said, we need to understand it's not real. It's just wishful thinking, because the facts show there is no spirit of discernment. I don't want to go beyond that at this point and say that these individuals, these leaders knew what Jody was doing. I can't bring myself to believe that they knew what she was doing and are still giving her blessings and meeting with her. But I don't want to have a guilt by association kind of thing. The only thing I want to have happen here is to say there is no spirit of discernment in the LDS church. And, we, and the church needs to stop talking about it as if it's a real thing. Any comments about that before I go on? The one thing I want to note here, RFM, is that the church, you know, always seems to be having meetings with the wrong people. It somehow, if you are a really unhealthy person, um, 
but somehow have some influence in the community. You have no problem meeting with top church leaders. Um, you know, Elder Holland gave me a phone call. I didn't, I didn't really get a chance to get much of a sit down with him. He wiggled my ear one time in a conference, but I didn't get a chance to sit down and, and chat with him. The fact that these abusive, you know, therapists and, uh, uh, Tim Ballard is another one that comes to mind. You know, he has no problem getting in close with, with church leaders. It just seems strange to me who's able to rub shoulders with them and who isn't. What do you think, Rebecca? Yeah, I agree with that. And we've talked about this before. My thought when, and, and I will say this, I on purpose did not read through any of the journals. I watched the 2020 episode. That was enough for me. So this will be Whew, a first time through for me. And I commend you for reading through all of this RFM and being able to bring it to us because this is rough stuff. But my first thought when I when I heard about the meeting with Brad Wilcox is that here in Utah, he actually teaches maturation and sexuality classes to young people. I think it's junior high age. In the public schools. In the public schools. Uh, uh, I think a year ago or so, this kind of came out that he's been doing this and people wondered what was the credential? What was the experience? Why was he doing this? And I kind of wondered if there was, I don't know, some connection there with a therapist and, you know, God forbid they're not trying to start a program together, right? Something like that. I mean, your mind kind of goes there, but there is that connection where he does work with youth and, and counsel on maturation and things like that. So I, I can't explain it. And I'm not familiar with all the details, but I do know that she was doing more than just meeting with top church leaders. She had their endorsement and recommendation of members to go get therapy with her. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. So we'll go ahead and we'll continue on now with the journal. July 11th, 2023, Tuesday, big day for evil is what uh, Ruby Frankie writes. Big day for evil. E, now that's the daughter, the 10-year-old daughter. E manipulates me. She won't scream when Jody is around. See, she's nice enough to mention Jody's name. She won't scream when Jody is around. But with me, she wails all night. She screams. E screamed cried and would hit her head on the tile floor. Today, Jody confronted her. E admits to putting on a show for her mother. E says she wants to be pitiful. R, now that's the 12-year-old boy. R was told to stand in the sun with his sun hat. By the way, this is in St. George or right by St. George, Utah. This is July 11th, 2023. Bill, I know you live down there. What's the weather like outside in July? Oh, in July, we're talking 110 to 113 degrees. Uh, it's a dry heat, though, so it's a little more comfortable. Um, as you can imagine, this it is insane to leave any human being out in St. George, Utah weather in the middle of summer for more than maybe 20 minutes, half an hour tops. And then you should be trying to find shade or an air-conditioned room, uh, preferably. Yeah. Would you do that to your dog, Rebecca? <laughs> no. And what struck me about this as a mom of three boys, uh, you spend your whole life keeping them out of the sun. You buy the sunscreen, you buy the clothes that are protective. You put on the hat, you call them back inside to put on more sunscreen. You give them the sunscreen chapstick. I mean, this, this is a real thing. You protect them. This is what you do. This was happening here. I, I have, I can't even, I can't even fathom it. R was told to stand in the sun with his sun hat. He is defiant. No, he says. I told him a couple more times. R or I should, R, my son, or I should say his demon stays in the shade. So he moves in the shade to get out of the sun and Ruby saying, it's not him doing it. It's his demon. I push R into the sun. R comes back. I come back with a cactus poker and I, I don't know what is that. Is that a, a spine from a cactus? Is that what she's talking about? A cactus poker. When I poke his, I'm sorry, were you saying something, Bill? I was going to look it up and see what that is. Yeah. I come back with a cactus poker. When I poke his back to get in the sun, R doesn't even flinch. I poke him on the neck. He is in a trance and doesn't appear to feel anything. Well, he's been standing in the sun all day but she attributes it to demonic possession. Jody taps him on the cheek to wake him up. 
And by the way, when I say she's nice enough to mention Jody, I mean she's nice enough to inculpate her in this horrendous behavior, this criminal behavior, as well as herself in her journal. Now, the devil doesn't like when you get your subject. These are not necessarily consecutive pages. I have taken a few to illustrate certain things. And once again, if you want to get the full flavor of everything, read it all. It took me maybe an hour to do. Possibly, this will take less time tonight, but this is done to illustrate certain things that I'll comment on as we go along. The devil doesn't like when you get your subject, her children are subjects now, when you get your subject to agree to truth. So she says to R, her son, do you know I love you? He says, yes, ma'am. She says, do you know G. Joe? Now, I expect it means like something like Grandma Joe, that's probably an abbreviation for Jody or a nickname, I'm guessing. Do you know G. Joe loves you? Yes, mom, or yes, ma'am. Then she says, do you know the Savior loves you? And he says, yes, ma'am. R wants out of his outcomes. After our talk, R stays in the shade. I take my old mop water and go to R. I show R the water. Then I pour the water on him. It's hot outside. It feels good, doesn't it? Apparently, she says to him, and he says, yes. An hour later, G. Joe takes R on a little walk to the pool. And by the way, would it be possible to get us off the screen here, Bill, so we can just see this and make it a little bit bigger for me? Thank you. G. Joe takes R on a little walk to the pool. She talks, she talks on how R. R. have love twisted. If R. likes something, someone does, he calls it love. If he doesn't, he thinks it's not loving. G, there you go again, G Joe, then pushed R into the pool. R swam to the side. G Joe pulled him out. Feel good, refreshing? Yes, ma'am. Now, um, it gets really bad here. I went out a couple hours later and asked if he wanted the pool again. Yes, ma'am. Because being pushed in the pool, that's heaven because he's being made to stand outside in the sun. Yes, ma'am. Will you let me push you? R laughed. Then tried not to act too excited. Of course, he's excited about going in the pool. R cooled off and went back to his spot. I put my hands on his face. R have you ever heard someone talk underwater? She asks him. He says, yes, ma'am. I know R is in there somewhere. I know deep down under all this anger, you can hear me. It may sound like I'm underwater with you, but hear me. I love you, she tells him. R get, gets teary. Then I put my hand do you know, can you see that word? Then I put my hand tightly over his nose and mouth. I am coming to you in this water and putting my hands on your nose and mouth. The devil has, the devil says, the devil lies and says, I'm hurt, I'm abusing you, I'm hurting you, abusing you. That's what she says the devil is telling him. The devil's telling you I'm abusing you. But are, what am I really doing? He says, you are putting oxygen on me to help me breathe. And she says, yes, that's right. R acted like he wanted to beat me up this morning. And then he was irritated and intrigued and interested. And then two hours later, he drinks water from the hose, steals water. So he gets in trouble for stealing water, which is defined as going to the hose when he's outside being made to stand out there and getting water out of the hose. That's a violation. That's disobedience. That's him stealing water. R is compulsive. He feels no remorse for his choices. He shuts down and says he wants to go to jail. Notice this, okay? He shuts down and says he wants to go to jail. R says, the boy says he worships the devil and has no interest in changing. And then there's a word there. I want the outcome of B. 
being changed or with that want the outcome of being changed, but I don't want to do the work that it requires. Okay. I want the outcome of being changed. He says, he said, but I don't want to do the work that it requires. R doesn't actually know what jail means. He has no comprehension what throwing your life away means. He just wants the immediate gratification of sitting in an air conditioned car ride to juvie. He wants stimulus. R is so back and forth. Now, if you'll hang on just a second here. I apologize. I still have a bit of a cough. It's getting better though. What's going on here now? You may remember if you've seen the door ring video from the neighbor's house where he shows up on August 30th in the middle of the day of 2023. And he asks for a favor to the man who comes out and sees him. And the man says, well, what favor do you want? He says, well, I want two favors. It's actually one. He says, would you take me to the police station? And the guy, of course, calls the cops. After reading this journal, of course, I obviously thought that he wants to go to the police station to turn his mom in, to turn Jody in, to help out his sister. After reading this journal, I think that he wanted to turn himself into jail because he knew that being in jail would be preferable to the life he was living at Jody Hildebrand's house, where he's at the mercy of Jody Hildebrand and his mother, Ruby Frankie. So if you have any comments on that, go ahead. But I'll I'll continue reading otherwise. Rebecca? I think you're right. I actually do think you're right about that because I think when you're interrogated like that, you're broken down, you finally just snap. You say, I don't care. Whatever punishment you're holding over my head, I'll take it. I'll take it. Anything is better than this. And I think that's what he was doing. Take me to jail. Anything has got to be better than what I'm suffering here. And the neighbor and asked him, what's it about? He said, it's personal business. Right. It, it seems like, obviously, there's some deep level of mental instability here. And Jody Hildebrandt wasn't qualified enough in her therapeutic practice to recognize that she was essentially living with another person who was this mentally unstable. The insanity of these kids being held at Jody's house, Jody's the therapist, Jody, uh, and here's, you know, she doesn't even recognize this, this family that's living with her. The mom is out there. Of course, she's out there too by the fact that you know, she's in just as much trouble. It just, and then you got these two people meeting with church leaders and church leaders don't have a clue that they're sitting down with mentally unstable people who have very unhealthy behaviors and motivations. And like you said, RFM, what we get from this is the spirit of discernment is just doesn't work. And Mormonism just keeps telling you it does, but saying something doesn't change the fact that the, uh, all data points point to the fact that it doesn't. Yeah, we'll get to another point. Actually, I may as well get to it right now, which is I can forgive church leaders for not having a spirit of discernment that they never had in the first place in spite of what they believe or what the church teaches. I can forgive them for being fooled. But now they've pleaded guilty. We know what was going on. We know that it happened up in Idaho with Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. Lori Vallow having been found guilty now as of this point. And... Uh, there are other circumstances where this same kind of thing is going on. There was that kid, David, who was kidnapped uh, before his high school football game in Arizona. Yeah, the doomsday then, mom. Yeah. yeah, and then picked up heading into Alaska from Canada, I think, across the border. Yeah, this stuff is going on in the church. These are representative samples. These are not the only people. These are not the only Mormon adults who are abusing they're Mormon children in the name of God. And the church knows it and apparently does nothing. I have not heard them say anything about this or say that uh, this kind of thing is going on and condemning it and letting everybody know that this is not of God. This is not the way uh, Latter-day Saints conduct themselves. And if they're doing it, they need to turn themselves into the bishop right now. Well, I feel that that journal could have been written by Lori Vallow, that theme of your children aren't your children, they've been possessed, and that's rooted in Mormon doctrine, the old doctrine that you can find, you know, when you're looking for the meat, not the milk. And it's very frightening. I feel like they're very the same. And of course, in Lori's situation, 
I, I feel like these children could have ended up like that very easily. I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to see that Ruby's children could have ended up like that. No, like and what we're going to find out in the journal, little bits and pieces that are still going to be in the, the parts that I've collected and it will read, is that Jody Hildebrand was in the process of buying lots of acreage down in Tucson, Arizona, because it wasn't working with these two kids. They needed to be in a place out in the middle of nowhere where they don't have neighbors on acreage so they can work the demons out of them. And I am certain, as certain as I can be of anything, that if that boy had not escaped on August 30th of last year and gotten the police's help and intervention, that that boy and that little girl would be buried under the desert sand in Arizona today, just like Lori Vallow's kids. That's where all this is going. It's obvious that's where it's going. None of it's working. They're being defiant. So the punishments keep getting more draconian. Okay, so I'll go to this next one. And if I can just have the whole thing up there on the screen. Thanks so much, Bill. So where was I? He is compulsive. He feels no remorse for his choices. He shuts down and says he wants to go to jail. I read that part. That's where I introduced the part about going to jail, right? So let's go to the next one. When we get home to G. Joe's, once again, I think that's Jody Hildebrand's, I let R know. Now, here I think they put the wrong uh, letter. I think they mean E there. I think this is the 10-year-old daughter. I let E know she, see, she has hardened her heart and will do one more day of fasting to invite her to humble. Now, I've got to tell you something here. If you read the page before, and once again, I had to, otherwise I would have been reading all night through the entire program. The page before, what Jody says is that she has made her 10-year-old daughter fast for two days because of disobedience, which means she's starving her for two days. And at the end of that two days, she's going to be able to eat something. This is at the end of two days of starving her child. When she says, I let her know she has hardened her heart and will do one more day of fasting to invite her to humble. Three days without food is what this girl's going to go through. And she's been led after two days of being starved to think she's going to get something to eat. And what they, they feed them is pitiful, but at least it's food. It's like water and chicken and lentils. It's uh, basically prison fare uh, at an old West prison, not even modern day prison fare. It's horrible, but that's the food. But she doesn't even get that. At the end of the time when she thinks she's going to be able to get something to eat after two days of fasting, her mom says, nope, you're going to have to fast another day. <sighs> okay. Oh, and guess what happens? The little girl, she flips out and begins ranting. She refuses to get up. She lies on the floor all day speaking dishonest chants because G. Joe is on the phone with clients. Remember, it's in Jody Hildebrand's house and she's conducting business from the house. She's on the phone with clients. I don't go in and match her level of aggression, which apparently Ruby Frankie would do when G. Joe's not on the phone. I don't go in and match her level of aggression. All day, E makes rhymes about, quote, so she's quoting little chants that her daughter is saying during her third day of starvation. My mom starves me and calls it fasting. My mom won't lift two fingers and bring me food because all she does is lie on the bed and eat brownies. My mom says she is the most loving mom in the world. Blah, blah, blah. If I can't ever go home, because remember, she's not in her home, this little girl or the little boy. They're at Jody Hildebrandt's. They've been taken out of their home. And that's part of the punishment. If I can't ever go home, then what's the point in being obedient? And finally, I'm going to run away. G. Joe helped me intervene after work, which I guess means after Jody Hildebrand's work was over. She helps Ruby intervene now with the children. Here's the pattern and here's the insight into what they're thinking. Pattern, allowing lies to be spewed gives the devil a platform. Articulating lies reinforces possession. The longer the lies are allowed to be spewed, the larger the, inter the, larger the intervention, physical, the intervention needs to be. And that says physical with a, um, an asterisk, asterisk. So it probably goes somewhere with an asterisk at any rate. 
I cut more off my 10-year-old daughter's head because she shaves her head as punishment. I cut more off E's head. We doused her with water in the dog wash. E said she wanted to run away. Jody told her she has no idea what is waiting for her. Yeah, you don't want to jump out of the boat, right? Because it would be so much worse outside the boat and outside Jody's home. So you better not want to run away because things will be really bad for you out there. I will continue. These selfish, selfish children who desire only to take, lie, and attack have zero understanding of God's love for them. They don't know G. Joe is selling her home, this priceless Snow Canyon gem. I'm guessing Snow Canyon is a pretty affluent community down there, Bill. Is that it correct? Is. It is, yeah. Okay. This Snow Canyon gem. Why? So she can purchase land where these two can work. Gijo has been looking for property with Suaros Cactus and is feeling more imminent the need to get these kids to open land. She is willing to consider less than ideal property for them. This is a spiritual matter. Now, this is apparently quoted from uh, Jody Hildebrandt. This is a spiritual matter. I can't in good faith leave you with these two gremlins. I won't do that. These are God's children. Swaros don't matter when souls are on the, on the line. I think that's what it's saying. One hour later, we move quickly. Jody and Jay, who is someone else, um, Jody and Jay are going on a road trip to look at property in Arizona. Ruby has some cash in the bank. And strange that Ruby is now referred to here in the third person, but that's the way it reads. Ruby has some cash in the bank. If the property is right, we can move on financing immediately. We decided the escalation of the kids is not manageable here and now. Our, my 12-year-old son, is now, slip, is now seething, angry, defiant. E, my daughter, is lying on the floor. We will bring them in. R, I will clean up out in the desert as he has pooped himself. He will then stand or sit on the patio. Now I've seen him, from, now I'm seeing him from the window. E, the daughter, I will bring into the cool house and she can sit in the pantry. They will think they won. They will think they got what they wanted. They will relax. Then pop, we will drop them like hot potatoes out in the desert down there in Arizona, their new home. You are going to get exactly what you asked for. If you two want to make any comments, please go ahead. I'll continue to read. But Rebecca, I mean, this is horrific to me. And I can only imagine that a mother might feel even more horrified. Yeah, like I said, I stayed away from this and I just kind of watched the documentary and I was right to stay away from it. I, I, I can't even express myself right now. I can't even imagine how you could be a mother looking at your children and do 1% of what they're doing. And, and who is Jody? Why, why is she obsessed with these children too? It's the most unhealthy thing I've ever heard of. And again, I just have to think about little boy and his bravery. I mean, that's, that's really what turned it. The outcome, we all know what would have happened. That, that little boy is an absolute hero. And yeah. I think now that we read this, we understand what it took for him to surmount that and to go for help because he was psychologically broken, physically broken, and he still did it. So she tried to break him. She just I, couldn't. Right. And I, I find out when reading this that this was at least the third time he had run away when he actually was successful. And I look at this kid and I'm so full of admiration. And I think of Steve McQueen in The Great Escape. By the way, last night was the 80th anniversary of the actual escape. And, you know, continuing trying to escape, getting caught, thrown back in the cooler, try, escaping again, getting caught, getting thrown. But he continues to try to escape. 
Bill, any thoughts from you before I go on? Um, I've never won a father of the year award. Um, on a one to 10, I'm probably like a six, six and a half. And I'm sitting here listening, uh, to the story and it is, it's, you use the right word. It's horrific. You, you have children being treated in ways that I told you earlier in a phone call, they will carry with them dysfunctional thinking and dysfunctional behavior for the rest of their life because of the trauma that this gave to them. And, you know, if you think of, if they, if he ran away to get himself put into jail, cause that the idea of jail was better than being abused. It almost sort of hints at the idea that he really wasn't running to get help. He just wanted to get the hell away from this thing that was happening, that he was willing to go to a, a place that was described as worse uh, because anything was going to be better than this. As soon as that neighbor came out, if he's trying to call on, you know, his mom, get to the phone that's what you've got to get to is a phone and dial 911 and you are safe but no yeah. that's not what he wants he doesn't even want to talk to the neighbor about what it is that's been going on he just wants the neighbor to give him a ride to the police station yeah so okay so can we continue now put this up on the stage thank you bill um so we've got this part and this was in the works buying this property down by tucson arizona that's why i say they would be buried in the desert by now if this boy had not been so brave and escaped now here's another uh dialogue that she writes down between herself ruby and her son r me what do you want r more different foods and a soft bed me why don't you ask satan do you think satan will give you these things her son says no me why not her son says because he did, he doesn't have the power. And Ruby says, why would you serve a God who has no power to give you your desires? Dumb. And her son is silent. Then he, I believe this is another R. It looks like it's a, a redaction without a letter in it. But Blank had another episode with demons. So this is probably E. She gives herself to them. She agreed to stop being deceptive with her facial expressions and crying and whining. Underlined, whining is the devil's voice. Whining is always a demon. She hurt facial expressions. Blame me for her misery. Or her hurt facial expressions. Blame me for her misery. Isn't that crazy? Her 10-year-old daughter's expressions are blaming Ruby for the daughter's misery. And... Ruby has to chalk that up to demons. She, the daughter at the center of her misery. Okay, her face is deceptive. After E did stairs. This is having her go up and down stairs. I don't know how many times. But you go, you run the stairs, and you have to do stairs for a certain amount of time. That's one of your punishments. After E did stairs, she sat on the park bench looking at the mountain views. She was told to sit and be still and eat her dinner. Okay, so here's a description of the dinner. Carrots hummus, grilled cheese, water. That's dinner. When you get it. And then she says, E in a power play brought her empty plate to the door and then removed her sun hat. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Now this is July 14th, 2023. It's a Friday. E woke up. I reminded her that if she whined, cried, or squinted her eyes at me or soured her face, I would be buzzing her hair. If she is going to act sick, she can look sick. She agreed with a smile. I told her because she didn't listen the night before, she would do two sets of boxes slash stairs with a five-minute break. So what appears to happen is that you can run up and down the stairs, be forced to do that as a punishment, a more severe punishment, is if you have to hold heavy boxes and run up and down the stairs. That's what it means, I believe, when it says do two sets of boxes slash stairs with a five-minute break. She did the first set easily and agreeably. After five minutes of rest, she began whimpering. When she got to the bottom stair, she slipped, and Ruby puts that in quotation marks, she slipped and dropped the box. I put her in the dog wash and shaved her head. 
then back to the boxes. I told E, and then it's apparently blank without being redacted. And she responds, yes, ma'am, with tears. Ruby tells her, it's heavier than boxes, right? So it must have been something in that blank spot about doing something heavier than boxes. She says, yes, ma'am. Ruby says, E, I can help you find relief. You have told so many lies about me that you resist to be obedient. Why do you keep being buddies with Satan? E says, I don't want to work. Ruby says, don't you see it's because you follow Satan that you keep doing boxes? If you were humble, you would be inside making pancakes with Julie and me. And by the way, that Julie, I think that was the J above that they forgot to redact here. Um, or it could be Jody. I'm not sure. It looks like Julia, regardless. Uh, e agreed to sit on the park bench and think about her choices. I made it very clear if she, and then it goes on to the next page. Okay, so let's go to the next one. This is the next day, Saturday, July 15th. There are days and nights that reveal, oh my gosh, this was one of the hardest things for me to read. I'll just read it for you. You can make your own judgments. There are days and nights that reveal God's most poignant mercies and miracles. Last night, God gave me a miracle. I absolutely will never, ever forget. I know when God gives you an errand, you do the best you can to fulfill it. He will protect you. I went to bed around 12, 10 a.m. E, my daughter, on the floor next to my bed are my son, 12 years old, on the patio outside my sliding glass window. Oh, man. I think it says, oh, man. Just writing this, I am shaking. Shaking. If... Pam hadn't, there are some names in here that should be redacted, but if Pam hadn't uh, volunteered to take A to American Fork for her ALT test, then I would not have been here. And my life and Jody's and my family's would forever be different. She's saying if she had not been here, then their lives would be forever different. Okay, what happened? At 2.45 a.m., I woke straight up out of bed, straight up. I couldn't see R, my 12-year-old son. He was gone. I, I opened the sliding glass door. Remember, he's out on the patio, sleeping. I opened the sliding glass door, and there was no sign of him. He did leave an arrangement of rocks in little, in letters and words. He wrote me a message. Too scared. I forgot how to read. I ran to Jody's room and woke her up. She came out with me. The message said, this is the message that her 12-year-old son had put in pebbles right before he ran away. Jail. I will call when I get there. That's another reason I think that he was going to turn himself in. In pebbles, he leaves this message for his mom. Jail. I will call when I get there. Blank and I scoured the house and yard. Jody got flashlights. Jody and Blank took her car, and I got Blank up and went in mine. Oh, God. Oh, Father. We need a miracle. We need your help now. Send the hosts of heaven. Show us the way. Please, please, Father, answer now. I've done everything you've asked. Protect me. Protect Jody. Protect us protect us. I heard in my head, go right. I went left and all the way to the roundabout on the main street to rule it out and make sure he hadn't reached the main road yet. This sounds it's, like Elder Holland's wrong roads. Well, what it sounds like to me is when somebody gets out and you don't know how far they've gone and you're trying to keep them from getting away, you go out immediately to the furthest point where you think they might have gotten to, and you scour it to make sure that they haven't gotten that far, that far yet, and then you start coming back toward home. Okay, anyway. No sign of R. I turn back to go down the dip and then turn right. Father, 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 hear me. Now I go right, then right again. This road doesn't look familiar. 
I speed up to cover as much road as I can. I'm sitting here rooting as hard as I can for this little kid to get away and for her to be foiled in her attempt to catch him and take him back to this hellhole. I speak, I speed up to cover as much road as I can, racing the sun, racing the devil. Then I see R walking on the left side of the road. I call Jody to let her know. I turn the car around and stop. I get out of the car. R, the 12 year old boy, is shocked to see me. Get in the car. You shocked to see me? R nods his head and gets in. And I think it would be R in the back, me, A R in, and R in front. Well, I don't know. Is this E in the back? I don't know if the little girl's in the back. I mean, they can't leave her at home alone. She might run away too. 2.45, I wake up. I think that says 3 o'clock, we leave in cars. 3.14 a.m., I call Jody with R. The sun started lighting the roads just an hour and a half later. The devil wants me in prison. My children dead. Now, this is important, and there's a reason besides it's just a terrible, terrible story. But this is something I think was very important legally. Because here, Ruby is acknowledging the fact that if he got away and if he reported what they were doing to police, that she would go to prison. So there's an acknowledgement of her state of mind, regardless of how mentally disturbed she is. She knows that if she's caught doing what she's doing, she's going to jail. And I think that may have been very important in the prosecution of this case. Um, the devil wants me in prison, my children dead. I meet Jody back home, me deliberate in the car while, or we deliberate in the car while the two of uh, the two kids go back to bed. No, not the two kids. It's somebody else. I don't know who else is in the house. R stands in the garage where we can see him. He has zero remorse, zero fear, zero expression. By the way, good for you, R. Good for you. You're a hero. Jody, no, he is cold, calloused, and hard. Angry, he isn't calling the shots. Jody and I agree to buy ourselves time until we have more of an environment conducive to an intervention. We need land. The spirit told, I think that's Jody very clearly, don't let those kids' choices ruin your life. We have work to do. You can force repentance. To de-escalate the situation I brought R into the house, I tied a rope to my feet and him, to my waist and his. R will now sleep in a soft bed with me which in the next page she rues the fact that he gets to sleep in a soft bed because now he's getting what he wants, but she has to do it in order to keep him from running away. Um, we are getting close to the end of this. Uh, Rebecca, Bill, do you have any comments about anything I've read so far? It doesn't end, does it? It just, this, the abuse, I know. it just keeps going and going. Rebecca. I'm just, I'm really disturbed just by the use of Satan, Satan's in your heart, Satan wants us to do this. I mean, it's just the, that mentality. We're in the 21st century. Really? This is really happening? And I guess it is. We look at Lori Vallow and it's the same thing. It's a reality in their lives and they it impacts everybody in this extraordinarily, horrifically negative way. But just this idea that their children are full of Satan, their children are demons. I mean, these kids are traumatized out of their minds. That's why they're numb. That's why they're acting out. They're completely traumatized. And yet Jody and Lori with this, or sorry, look what I did, Lori, <laughs> Ruby, yeah. with this religious background that they're from, it, it just permeates every decision, the it colors of the way they see everything. It's Satan or the savior loves you when you're being good, or don't you want the savior to love you? It's so manipulative. I, I just, Ugh. I'm sorry. This is really rough. We are almost to the end, of, and it's even <laughs> harder to read the whole thing. Um, I wasn't kidding when I made that warning at the beginning, but it doesn't seem to have dissuaded many people. We got over a thousand people watching live at this point, which may be a record for the newscast. At any rate, 
Uh, did you have, you already mentioned something, Bill. Okay, okay, let's go ahead and put it back up there and we'll conclude with these representative samples from the journal of Ruby Frank. Frankie, August 9th. Remember, it's August 30th that he finally gets away. August 9th, 2023, Wednesday. Mom to R, that's her 12-year-old son. You keep saying you are unwilling to do uncomfortable things, but I watch you continuously do uncomfortable things the devil tells you to do. You would rather be uncomfortable than be obedient. This isn't really about being uncomfortable. This is about adamantly refusing obedience. You would rather be uncomfortable rather than obedient. Is that true? And her son says, yes, ma'am. And then apparently it says, mom to R, when did you sell your soul to the devil? This is her asking her son, her 12-year-old son, when did you sell your soul to the devil? And he responds, two or three, which I'm guessing means when he was two or three years old. Mom, did he come to you or you to him? And her son says, he came to me. Mom says, and what is he giving you in exchange for your soul? Money, fame, strength, a person? And her 12-year-old son says, nothing. I tell R, the son, he can still keep his soul. He can have a life. He blank to stay here. I told him to think about how he wants to be obedient to a devil who offers nothing in exchange for everything. Honestly, I've got to tell you, I there's so much of a luck of the draw and a roll of the dice as to what family you get born into. And I'm thanking my lucky stars right now that I was born into the family that I was born into. It wasn't perfect, but it sure wasn't this. And I can't imagine my mother, when I'm 12, asking me questions like, when did you sell your soul to the devil? And me being so beaten down that I have to give an answer, oh, when I was two or three, because I got to play along. How much am I believing it? I don't know. How much am I playing along? I don't know. But that's got to leave huge scars. All right. R becomes aggressive and destructive. He started banging and hitting doors. I went, oh. I went in and kicked him. Knock this off. R continues to be destructive and violent. I put on a pair of boots. I went in and kicked him again. You want me to stop? What are you getting from Satan when he tells you to kick the door? Huh? Nothing but more pain. You want me to help you? Yes. No. Ruby, you want me to feed you? Her son says, yes. Ruby says, no. You want me to show, uh, shower and provide for you? I don't think it's shower, but it's something. Do you want me to provide for you. And her son says, yes. And Ruby says, no, you want to serve the devil and fight me and destroy all that I provide and then expect me to give to you. Go ask the devil to help you. Go ask the devil to feed you. And that's the last one that we're going to be reading. I think that's a representative sample. Uh, I find myself being affected again somewhat, um, which is not usual for me. I am really quite inured and jaded. And I've seen a lot of ugly stuff, but this is among the worst that I've seen. Yeah. The only thing I would say here, we talked about this earlier. I mean, the church has no problem getting up and giving talks on food storage, although not as much of that probably as there was in decades past. Family history work, make sure you say your daily prayers, whatever things you know are involved in the gospel. And yet they had some sort of direct interaction with this situation. And the inability to come forward and, and at the very least to address child abuse in really serious ways that make it known that this kind of stuff is just not okay. Um, they, they don't really want to give those talks and I don't, I don't see those talks. They're not. No, I haven't either. Happening. And you know, I watch general conference very closely <laughs> every single talk and I report on them and I will again this year this April in a couple of weeks. But look, if I'm in charge of the church, what I'm seeing is what the entire world is seeing is that members of my church, adult members are abusing children of my church. And if I do not speak out against it and call these people by name to account, 
and strictly warn all the members of the church that if you do this, you are going to be excommunicated as fast as possible, and you're going to lose all of your blessings. If I am the leader of the church and don't do that, at this point and by this point, some of the guilt is on my hands because I'm not I'm not um, a person who is so optimistic as to believe that there aren't scads of other kids right now as I'm talking who are in the church who are being abused by their parents for these same reasons. These We can't just pretend that the ones we find out about are the only ones that exist because obviously there are more of them. And right now, the church, by not talking against this and speaking out about it and condemning it, is responsible for any abuse that continues, which would have stopped if they had spoken out about it. Rebecca. Well, I feel it's hard to speak out because this idea, this doctrine is baked into the religion. The idea that you have to watch out for Satan, the adversary can impact you, your actions can show that you're under the power of Satan. It's there. I mean, obviously these people are taking it to the extreme, but these are things that you hear. I remember trying to raise my kids to not know anything about that or ever hear that. And I moved into a new ward. There was a much older primary teacher who was teaching my four-year-old. And he came home from church after the first Sunday. And he said, mom, Satan's in my body. Satan's in my heart. I have to be careful that Satan doesn't make me do things or take me over. I was livid. This is not what you say to a four-year-old. He was traumatized for several months as we kind of talked that out. But it was this older woman this kindly Mormon woman, and and I I will say she probably believed that. That's how she had been raised. That that kind of rhetoric that was very real in the church decades ago. I see that it's resurging. This whole idea it's sort of apocalyptic. It's it's Satan. It's demons, and it's extremely dangerous. And I agree with you, RFM. They don't address this. They don't address this from the top, and I don't know how they can ignore it. I don't see how they don't see what's going on. I couldn't sleep at night if I'm just. If I have the power to speak out against it mm -hmm. as a leader of the church and I don't, how do I sleep at night? How do I look myself in the mirror? Yeah. Just a, a, like a tangent connection here, but when I think about certain Old Testament stories, the easy one to go to is Abraham, mm -hmm. and he, he feels there's a voice in his head that God's talking to him and telling him to go sacrifice his kid. And I only ask the audience, among the audience being obviously you know non-believers and believers alike, for whatever believers are out there, maybe recognize that some of the stories that have been passed down to us of people talking to God and getting messages, that maybe the possibility is there that we have people who were mentally unstable and they hear voices and they're doing things that would be the most inappropriate things. In other words, if I'm connected in any way to Abraham in that day. And Abraham says, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, God's talking to me. He's telling me to go sacrifice my kid. Maybe what we should do is take Abraham to see a doctor. Of course, we're talking back then, but in the modern day, take Abraham to see a doctor. Maybe Abraham needs to be committed. Get that kid Maybe. away from him. Get the last thing we should do is trust anybody in any age saying that God told them anything that involves harming a child ever. Okay. Well, that's the end of that story for now. So, uh, sorry, it's kind of a, a downer story, but it, it needs to be talked about. And I do have a platform. I'm not a church leader, but I am a high priest, and I've got a show that I can talk about it on, and that's what I'm doing now. So please share this with as many people as you can so that other people can know about it, and hopefully the word will get out, and hopefully the church will be made uncomfortable enough to where they will speak out. Unfortunately, it seems to be the case that they will only speak out if they are shamed into doing the right thing. Yeah. Is the next thing, uh, the next story, is that yours, Bill? It is. Um, all right. So let me uh, put this up. There was an article in the Salt Lake Tribune said st uh, study shows shifting Latter-day Saint views on LGBT rights. The study they're pointing to is a study that came out of an organization called PRRI. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Uh, what they did, I'm going to go back here, one. What they did was throughout 2023, they interviewed more than 22,000 adults 
as part of their American Values Atlas. And this was all across the country. Uh, there was uh, data coming in um, from lots of different states. But then what's going on here is that the Salt Lake Tribune is uh, pooling out the data that pertain to either Utah or to Mormons. And so that's where the article comes from. I just want to note some of the main data points mentioned in the Salt Lake Tribune that came out of this PRRI research. Uh, and the main one that they went into in the article was members of the LDS church were the least likely to identify as LGBTQ when compared to other religious groups. So uh, people who identify as Mormon, we have to recognize the church claims a certain number of people in its membership, actives in and active members. When various organizations go out and do uh, polling or research data, get to collect surveys, significantly less people report or self-label themselves as Mormon, way less than the church reports as its total number. So in terms of people self-reporting as Mormon, uh, they're the least likely of all the groups to identify as an LGBTQ person within that group when compared to other religious groups. 3% of Latter-day Saints identify as LGBTQ, slightly less than white evangelical Protestants and Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so there. In contrast, more than a quarter of Unitarian Universalist, uh, 29%, uh, and nearly one in five of the religiously unaffiliated 19%, sometimes known as the nuns, identify as LGBTQ. And so there's this big discrepancy. Again, human beings are born. There's at least a, a significant degree of epigenetics or genetics in uh, how somebody is, their sexuality, what they're, you know, whether they're born straight or uh, bisexual or gay or lesbian. Um, and we ought to recognize there are certain motivational factors in and outside of religion, in high demand groups, and in uh, groups that are more lenient or liberal that would impact whether a person feels safe or even self-aware enough to recognize their sexuality and to declare it. And so what they're trying to do is get at like, why are these differences? Why are non-members, why is the amount of people who claim to be LGBTQ uh, so prevalent and why within Mormonism, for instance, is the number so low? So in 2015, 38% of U.S. Latter-day Saints, and it went into other data points too. They're, they collected data on how folks felt about the issues surrounding the LGBT community as well. So now we get into some of those. In 2015, 38% of U.S. Latter-day Saints opposed religious-based refusals. Uh, in other words, again, the old example is the cake maker doesn't want to make a cake. 38% of Latter-day Saints opposed that. Idea. In other words, 62% uh, of those who label themselves Latter-day Saints are perfectly fine with folks not baking a cake for people they don't want to bake a cake for. Um, by 2023, that number had grown to 41%. Support for non-discrimination. And, and to some degree, we ought to recognize that number is where it's at because the church has, alongside religious freedom, also articulated in the last decade, wanting people who are LGBTQ to have um, access to medical care, to be able to have the same rights as a married couple. And, and some of that plays into this. The next one, support for non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ communities ticked upward from 72 to 78%. So again, I think on, if we're going to give the church kudos, I think, yes, they've done it in a way that they've tried to make religious freedom the real priority. But we also ought to acknowledge they have said things about that members are going to pick up on messages that suggest that we allow LGBT people, LGBTQ people to enjoy the same privileges that cisgender heterosexual people enjoy in Utah or in society or in the church in terms of legality out in the secular world. So members are picking up on those messages and those numbers are shifting because of that. Again, those now the next one, those in favor of allowing same-sex couples to marry, a number that rocketed from 27% to 50% in 20, 2022 before slipping three percentage points the following year. Uh, last one here, according to a 2023 survey, more than one in five Latter-day Saint college students 
say they are something other than heterosexual. So 22% of Latter-day Saint college students, again, they interviewed adults. Here is a particular age group, and the number is sort of significant here. Um, This would be much higher than what general science would postulate about the percentage of LGBTQ people in our society. And so I think these are, they don't really have um, definitives for why these numbers are where they're at, but I think it's important for us exploring Mormonism to sort of stay in touch with where this issue kind of moves people uh, to take a stance over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, Because if we go back 20 or 30 years, these numbers were way different. And the strange thing that they noted was that several of these survey questions about where people fell in support of the LGBT community, LGBTQ community, sorry. Um, What we learn is that just in the last couple of years, that numbers that had gone so far in one direction started to back off a degree or two, a, a statistical point, two points, three points. So people are becoming a little more conservative again, starting to sort of maybe draw a line in the sand and say enough is enough uh, rather than be more in, you know, more inclusive of folks. And then, so they, the Salt Lake Tribune article uh, postulated three theories and it was mostly done through the interviews with folks in the articles, suggesting why they think the numbers are where they're at. And theory number one, many Latter-day Saints and especially women just don't know they're queer. Why the number of LGBTQ people in among the self-labeled Mormon subgroup, why that number is so low? Why are there so few people willing to claim that they are uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, queer? Uh, So it says that they don't know they're queer. With the law of chastity and a purity culture, you're discouraged from exploring or thinking about sexuality, Liz said, whether homo or heterosexual. As a result, the two said many are 20 years deep into marriage before they realize their sexuality differs from the norms set by their faith community. Theory number two has to do with what many see as the church's less than affirming policies and teachings, which they said lead a number of members to walk away from the faith after coming out. Whenever, whatever that might, I'm sorry, whenever that might be, church leaders have repeatedly affirmed the belief that marriage is between a man and a woman for a time labeling those who marry someone of the same sex as apostates and discourage social or surgical transitioning for transgender members. As a result, Ryan explained, once individuals identify as LGBTQ, they no longer see the remaining, they no longer see remaining in the church as an option. So it's less that LDS people don't identify as queer, she said, and more that queer people don't identify as LDS. And then the third theory Uh, Experience has taught the women that the social cost involved in coming out is simply too high for many Latter-day Saints who choose to remain closeted. I have quite a few friends who have told me in the past that they think they might be bisexual or on the spectrum, but that it isn't worth diving into, Ryan said, because acknowledging it doesn't make their lives easier. And Just FYI, Ryan is a female. It's a last name of a female. Um, And so... Uh, they gave two different graphs. These two are sort of in opposites, and I think this points to how the church approaches the issue. The first one is opposition to religiously based refusals. Uh, and in this instance, Latter day Saints are quite high. In other words, Latter day Saints, a high number of Latter day Saints, self identifying Latter day Saints, are okay with shop owners refusing business to people simply because they don't they don't agree with that person's humanity or their beliefs. Um, and then on the other side of it, support for non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people by religious affiliation. And on this one, you have Latter-day Saints sort of at the upper middle. And so in this instance, what it's saying is that Latter-day Saints, self-identifying Latter-day Saints, would are are voicing their belief that people in the LGBTQ community should have the right to the same equality within relationships that married people do, the same protections for uh, for you know being picked on or abused or 
crimes being had against whatever those things are. But these two are sort of disagreeing with each other. And I think the reason is, is because Mormons are taught both religious freedom, which is this graph, and uh, inclusivity of equal rights for LGBT people in this graph. And Mormonism has walked that line preaching both of those. And so I think it's a unique dynamic because I think in if you looked at this graph, often where somebody is on the low side on one, they would also be on the low side on the other. But Mormonism is sort of has a discrepancy in these two. And then I just want to end just saying that it isn't just Mormonism that's dealing with you know, homosexual issues or transgender issues in this moment. The whole, the whole world is. And so here was a guest article about Mormonism, uh, the mixed messaging, which we've covered several times here in the news, Mormon newscast. But here's one-fourth of United Methodist churches in U.S. have left in schism over the LGBTQ ban. So this was just uh, the end of last year that this article came out. This is the Baptist News. Church faces a three-dimensional decision. They Again, they have sort of the same problem. Their, their members want full equality on race, right? They are sort of in the middle on gender, and they're very conservative and have no problem with inequality on sexuality. Uh, so this is the Baptist church sort of facing this moment where people are being pulled in different directions on different issues. And then you've got the Pope recently, as there's been rumors about him resigning, and he has made lots of comments in the last year about trying to be more inclusive of uh, gay or transgender uh, members of the Catholic Church. And so you sort of see, uh, let me get that off screen. So you sort of see that everyone in religion is having to deal with the world changing, the internet makes information accessible, everybody knows people who are different than them. And all of these churches are having to make really big decisions about how they're going to move into the future, but they might do so in ways that cut off the youth from being active participants going forward. And no church with a long-term game plan is going to want to do that. And so you're seeing this moment with surveys by outside organizations, the church trying to take that data. Um, I'm sure they're trying to and take that data and try to make sense of it and figure out what the best path forward is in order to maintain some sort of vibrant membership up until recent, maybe the last decade, the church is heavily catered to its older Orthodox membership. But I think you're beginning in the last 10 years to see a church that is starting to cater to the youth. Yeah, I would agree. I think this issue will absolutely change the landscape of all religions forever. There's no way that it's not going to. And people are taking notice. People are taking notes. I went to a lecture from the wonderful Jana Reese, who wrote the book Next Mormons. Um, she crunches all kinds of data about who Mormons are, why they stay, why they leave. And a lot of her data was secret that she showed us. It's for her next book. But this is exactly what she's talking about, the changing attitudes toward exactly this issue issue. And the church can only, I think, hide its head in the sand for so long. It's going to come to a flashpoint. Again, I'm going to bring up Aaron Sherinian, our church spokesman, <laughs> who is an ally and is the new church spokesman and has not really spoken yet. Um, because I believe there are very conservative Orthodox members of the church who don't want to move in that direction of inclusivity. And then there are progressive Mormons, like I would call them the restore Mormons, the one that attends conferences like that, where it's all about inclusivity. There are two different churches, I believe, that exist within the Mormon church. And right now they're like this. This. They're very polarized, but there's no way you can survive like that forever. Look at the Methodists. When their worldwide vote voted to not include, you know, be in, not have inclusivity, not be on board with same sex marriage, schism, right? They split apart because their members are not going to have that. So I don't know if that's where we're headed. I feel more like the church will be able to pivot because that's what it's done in the past. Once the social issues and the pressure gets too great, I think they'll eventually be able to come up with some kind of workaround where it's okay and it fits in the doctrine. But right now we're in this really weird era, I think, where we see these both sides and they're really, although they're so polarized, they're like this, you know, there's no middle ground. 
Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that, Bill, is that, you know, you're talking about the the church catering to its older orthodoxy. In my day, when I joined the church when I was 18, the youth was orthodox. Yeah, yeah it was all orthodoxy. Yes, from the top down. Yeah. Just wanted you to know that. Yeah. For the record. <laughs> okay. Rebecca, you've got a great story for us too, I understand. I do. It's kind of a follow-up um, to your story last week, RFM, because if you recall on Monday, um, which this is the day after the Worldwide Women's Conference broadcast, RFM um, really dissected that for us, played a lot of clips, and of course we discussed the quote from Sister Dennis that... I put here on the title page, the statement heard around the world, um, because, oh my gosh, it's so small. I should probably have it memorized by now. There is no other religious organization in the world that I know of that has so broadly given power and authority to women. This is the statement made at the LDS Women's Conference, and everything went to hell in a handbasket after that. <laughs> so I, I'll kind of pick up after uh, what RFM talked about last week. And I'm calling this The Pushback Begins. So the church, of course, put this lovely artwork up on Instagram and they included that statement. Well, the women in the church began to comment. And Can I'm I talking make something about... clear, Rebecca. Yes, go ahead. This is a meme you made with all the little. Well, yes, of course. Right? That's not part of the artwork. That no, the of does. course. Of course, I always have to make a meme of anything I see. The artwork, the wonderful artwork was on the Instagram post. And then I, of course, had to add my own commentary because when I look closely at the artwork, it kind of looked like the women were looking to the side like, oh, my goodness. Right. So I added things like, are you kidding me? She did not just say that. So you're right. This is not the church putting out these little bubbles. This is me adding it. So thank you for clarifying that. But the bottom line is that people started to comment. I think by the end of the first day, there were over 8,000 comments and counting. And as we know now, I think it's up around 1,500. But but back 1, on the first day, I think so. 15,000? Yeah, 15,000. Sorry, 15,000. Yes. Thank you for correcting me. Yes. So let's just say a hell of a lot of comments. Should we just say that? <laughs> anyway, so it became a bigger issue than that. And as we read through these comments, a lot of them are faithful women sharing their experiences in the church and saying, I don't feel empowered. I don't feel like I'm heard. I don't feel like my experience matches what I'm here hearing on this worldwide broadcast. I know Dr. Julie Hanks ju jumped in and wrote quite a number of really meaningful comments. Nemo the Mormon was commenting. It was this, this really dynamic place where people just were kind of saying it out loud, you know, maybe how they'd felt. The statement had just finally made them realize I need to kind of express myself. Um, so what happened next was really interesting because the church pinned a comment at the top of that Instagram post, right? And I haven't really seen them do this before. So I think they must've been kind of overwhelmed, but I'll read the comment. This was pinned at the top of that post on the first day. It said, the church's social media team acknowledges the numerous comments that have emerged in response to this post. Thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts, feelings, and experiences. Your comments will be shared with church leaders who follow these issues. Hmm. <laughs> we, like you, strive to follow the example of Jesus Christ in our interactions, including conversations online. So it is telling you to be careful. You know, let's let's be Christ-like in our comments, which I felt everyone was. I felt they were sharing their personal experiences, but I thought it was really funny when they said these comments will be shared with church leaders who follow these issues. Who do you think they're talking about? <laughs> any I don't ideas? Think there's any such thing. <laughs> Are there any church leaders who follow these issues? <laughs> I was thinking maybe the strengthening the church member committee. That's kind of the AI. I was that I ask. Oh, okay. Yeah, the... I guess you're right. There are some church leaders who follow these issues. <laughs> I was going to ask you, is this the social media team or the social media yeah. listening team? That's like the I social was... listening team. Remember, that's the yeah. SCMC. That's right. We, we did that was the, the job, the employment yeah. opportunity that you talked about a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did that story where they were hiring a social listening person. And so I thought uh, this AI kind of shows that they've got earphones on, they're checking it out. Well, they don't have to listen very hard or in too many places. You've got 15,000 women commenting right here, telling everybody how they feel. And I, found, I ran across this on social media. I just thought it was hilarious. Someone said, if I owned a business and received 
in one day over 8,000 negative reviews, I would go ahead and admit I was doing something wrong. Mm. <laughs> of course, the key word there is business, right? So, so again, the church is just kind of monitoring these comments. And then uh, what happened is that suddenly in real time, we thought we started to see the comments being deleted. Some people say it was in real time. They were disappearing one by one. Some people thought everything disappeared. It was very convoluted. And I've, I've been reading all over social media about this. Nobody still seems to really understand what happened, but a lot of the comments disappeared. So of course, the next day there's an article that's in the paper that says, I think this was from the Deseret News, no, the Tribune, um, LDS church responds to firestorm over speech written about women and points to a glitch for the vanishing social media comments. So the church comes out and says, no, 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 we would never delete anything. This was a glitch. What did you guys think when you heard that, that they're claiming it's a glitch? So, so can I just say that every organization, whether it's the church in its official places or whether it's organizations like FAIR or Book of Mormon Central or uh, uh, the Neville Land, Neville Neville Land Neville, uh, Neville blog Land. from uh, Mike Parker, who created uh, Richard yep. Nigren, yep. they all delete comments. Yeah. I have seen the church and every one of those organizations, Ward Radio too, I think at times. Yeah. Uh, delete comments that they don't like. Yeah. Oh, so now we're supposed to believe for the first time, this was a glitch at the very moment that you couldn't afford a glitch to happen. Exactly. Okay. The least opportune glitch that ever could be. What did you think RFM? Did you believe it? Is it a glitch? Uh, I couldn't get past the part where they said that they never delete comments. What was that part that you read about deleting comments? I don't think I read anything like that. Yeah. You said something about that. We never delete comments and we didn't do this. Did we would I? never delete comments. Remember that? Yeah. Okay. I think it's not on the screen, but you'd read it as part of the, the response. Okay. And I just thought, does the church really have the moral high ground having a history of cutting <laughs> pages out of uh, early <laughs> church documents and hiding them away to keep people from finding out about them? Do they really have the moral high ground to expect to be believed exactly. when they say we never delete comments? Come on, yep. this this idea that the church is hiding something that which okay I won't play the rest of it. Most people in the audience can probably finish the quote yep. themselves. Very but they've famous. never hidden anything. No, no I, I wish I wish that the church had the moral high ground to be able to be believed when they say something like this. I mean, yep. this is regardless of whether it's true, but they have deleted so many things yep. and hidden so many things and lied about it so many times that when they say we didn't delete these comments. I'm not disposed to believe them. Yeah. No. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't. People were really, really upset. And they were upset that all these voices were being silenced and they couldn't believe that they had to, the nerve to do this in real time. So they're doing a little bit da damage control here. This even made the New York Times, if you can believe it or not. This was a big story. The, I mean, the church is always trying to get PR, but it usually ends up getting the kind of PR that they don't want, right? These are the things that make it into the New York Times. So there's an, and many other articles, but I thought hitting the Times, that was kind of the big time. So um, does the Mormon church empower women? A social media storm answers. And I'm just going to read like the first couple of paragraphs from this because it kind of sums it up really well. And it's very interesting. It says, uh, this is kind of from the middle of the article. It says, but when the church's official Instagram page posted an excerpt from Ms. Dennis's speech, which we read before, including that quote, the response was immediate, overwhelming, and largely negative. What a joke, one commenter wrote. The sexism in this organization runs deep. The post had more than 14,500 comments as of Friday morning. So the women's conference was Sunday. The Instagram post was soon after that. And by Friday, we've got almost 15,000 comments. Um, with some critical comments receiving thousands of approving likes. Anger had flared a couple days earlier when comments were deleted before being restored. And that's what I'm talking about. They were gone. They were back. Were they disappearing? People would say that they had commented and it would disappear instantly only to return later. Nobody really understood what was going on. I personally don't understand Instagram very well, just myself. So I can't be any help as far as offering any judgment in that. But um, in a comment on the post and in emails to the time, the church blamed an Instagram glitch. There it is, to glitch or not to glitch. Here's the important part. A spokesman for Meta, 
And of course, that is the platform for Instagram, which owns Instagram said there was no issue that had affected the comments. So Meta came out and said, and this is my little AI here, hey guys, there was no glitch, right? They came out and said it didn't happen. So of course, then everybody's like, I knew it. I knew they were deleting them, but still confusion. People didn't necessarily uh, believe the representative from Meta. Um, so I went over onto social media to try to see if I could sort this out. And like I said, so many different opinions. So I picked two of these comments that kind of summed up what people are saying. So one person says, um, this is again, just from social media. I just read a post on the Exmo sub from somebody who works in this field, sounded like they knew what they were talking about, who said they were following this in real time and that it appeared that the comments were being manually hidden as they were posted. So this is a person who works in this industry and can see what it looks like when somebody's doing that. And um, they said they were managing social media accounts on all continents while this was going on and there were no issues with any other accounts. So if true, this person sounds like they know what they're talking about. They also speculated that the church could possibly have had assistance from Meta because of its large ownership stake. So now we're into the conspiracy realm, aren't we? Could it be Meta and the church working together? I don't know. So that's one point of view. Another point of view is uh, they never turned the comments off. I checked the post many times, including during the commenting issue, and there was always there were always some comments showing up. The pinned comment was always there, that one that I read before from the church. When you turn comments off on um, Instagram, all of them are gone, including the pinned comments from the account owners. So we know they did not turn them off. So I like to call this glitch gate. Nobody knows, even today. Some people don't believe Meta. Some people do. Some people say they saw one thing. Some people say they saw another. I don't think we'll ever know. I guess the bottom line is just that there were thousands of comments and people did not put it past the church to have done that, <laughs> like both of you said before. So as we finish up here, let's see what happened. Oh, there we go. Um, of course, then the people that are the more faithful LDS mobilized and we have all kinds of articles and programs um, to kind of clear the air and make sure we understood what happened. So an article in the Deseret News, as a Latter-day Saint woman, I've been heard, valued, and empowered for decades. So because this one person has been heard, valued, and empowered for decades, that means that almost 15,000 people, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Ward Radio put out a episode called Debunking Comment Gate. And I did listen to the first part of that. It didn't seem that they really dealt with the statement. They just kind of dealt with some of the fray of the comments. So you that's sent that out to us, Rebecca. I watched I did. it last night. Oh, it good. Why don't you Ellis. comment on that? Great. Yeah, Cardin Ellis flying solo. Yeah. He never mentions the no. comment yeah. by Sister Dennis that ca right. caused all the uproar. Right. He acts as if it is simply the picture itself. Yeah, the artwork. That for some inexplicable reason, he's dumbfounded by, by it, <laughs> why there would be so much uh, vitriolic reaction to yeah. a simple painting. Yeah. Just for the record, this is also a guy who can't name the first presidency, so I don't really, it doesn't really fly past me that he's confused about everything going on mm -hmm. in Mormonism. Yeah. It's hard to miss the fact that it was over the comment. And I don't know, did he just miss it possibly or is he hiding it in order to make it sound more ridiculous that people re were responding vitriolically to a simple painting right it really didn't make much sense like i said i watched the first part and he talked about feminists feminists critics you know things like that all aimed at this painting which you described yeah. and he, he was trying to say what would it, and honestly maybe he never Maybe he never went to the next kind of screen and saw that it was about the quote, but I doubt it. So anyway, we have scripture plus um, weighing in on it. We have all kinds of posts on social media and most of them are, well, well, here's my issue with the whole thing is that the people that are trying to defend this statement, they're sharing experiences and they're saying, just because they're saying it never happened to me, therefore it never happened to you. And they're calling them critics and they're calling them feminists and they're calling them hostile. When really all these women were doing, these 15,000 women posting, were sharing their personal experience in the church. And how you many know? of those women hold the priesthood? Exactly. None. Well, which it depends. Means they're being disingenuous. <laughs> it depends on what you mean by hold. In That's... a good light, which is the prime directive <laughs> for all faithful Mormons.
Exactly. Yeah, it, it's a whole issue, and many people have podcasted about it. As I understand it, men bear the priesthood, and women are um, they bear the children. The priesthood. Yes, they kind of rub elbows with the priesthood, and that's enough. But again, these women were finally coming out, and they were sharing their personal experiences about it. And to call them critics or to call them feminists in such a negative way—that is very disingenuous. And you do not understand what's happening in your own church. So. Um. I have a thought about this. I think I might have an idea as to why there was so much response to that statement from Sister Dennis. And if you can put it back up there, if we can go to that slide. Let's see. So if people don't have it memorized like you do, they can see it. Well, I don't really, as I found out. Let's see. There it is. Within the church, my experience of being in the church, which is uh, 46 years now as a member of the church, I have frequently encountered women who justify they're not holding the priesthood by saying that, oh, they don't want all that responsibility yeah. anyway. You know, the men can have the priesthood. I don't want it. I don't want all that leadership power and have to do this and that, you know, and all these other things. Now, I've heard that many times. And whereas I may have secretly rolled my eyes at that comment, at least it's coming from a place of reality where the women who say that are justifying they're not having the priesthood, but recognizing the fact that they don't have the priesthood right. and that they don't have that power. But when Sister Dennis says this, she says, there is no other religious organization in the world that I know of, apparently she only knows about Mormons, that I know of that has so broadly given power and authority to women. Now she's trying to gaslight yes. the women of the church. And I think the response that was so vitriolic and this outpouring of emotion about this statement falls under the heading of don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. Yep. Nope. I agree. Absolutely. And that's what a lot of the women were saying. Our own leadership, our women, female leadership in the church. Don't tell me this because you know, it's not true. And I know it's not true. So please don't insult us. It, it is. It's insulting. You're yep. right. Yep. I know we did this last week. Yeah, we did. But- <laughs> but when you tell somebody RFM, I just blah, 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 I just gave you magical powers and I gave you magical authority. Okay. Now you have to be able to tell an outsider how that actually means something different from the moment before where you had no magical power or magical authority that I'd given you. And so I ask you, like, if for a woman in the church who really believes she has power and authority that is unique uh, that allows you to do something that you couldn't have done without it. What is the thing you can do? And whatever you describe, it's going to be just as invisible and uh, non tangible as the power and authority that you just said that you had. Well, by that power and authority, Mr. Real, I can minister to my sisters that I am assigned to minister to. I can hold callings in the Relief Society, in the Young Women's, and in the Primary, which a woman who is not a member of this church cannot do. So checkmate. In in every other church, in most other churches, women are doing the exact same thing. Exactly. And more. And And I think to me, go ahead. But not as well, apparently. Not not as as authoritatively and powerfully. That's right. And of course, we all know there are women ordained and in, there is a female prophet president in Community of Christ. So the issue here, of course, if people had not followed this, is that because the LDS Church believes they're the only church in the entire world that has the priesthood, just the fact that women are there rubbing elbows with men that have the priesthood, men that we ha- mean that women have access to more power than anyone else, an ordained leader in any other religion. And I thought this was a funny meme. My co-host on Mormonish Land and made it up. It says, I don't get what's wrong with girls. They can do everything boys can do except what boys can do. And that's pretty much it in the church. That's good. I, good yeah, Landon. I thought it was good. I know. Good job, Landon. Usually I make all the memes, but sometimes he really pulls one out. So, <laughs> all right. And there's so much to this issue and it's ongoing and we'll probably be updating every week on what's new. I do know that I did talk to the women who originally organized the walkout. Remember how the women were not allowed to be on the stand anymore and there was supposed to be a walkout on March 17th. She said that she is now in contact with oh. other people and through other social media avenues, there may be something else in the works there. And I have a feeling 
it's going to be far more well attended if there is some kind of organized effort to show your feelings. Because goodness knows you can't do it by sustaining at conference or anything like that. So, so people so we'll and women are hacked off now and the yeah. church has overplayed their hand yes. with these statements that they gave to the Relief yeah. Society presidency yeah. to say publicly yeah. and then do Instagram yeah. uh, postings on. Nope. Again, I ask, where is your PR team? And then I remember where he is. He's in his office, not coming out. So anyway. Surrender Sharinian. <laughs> no, just let Aaron speak. That's that's all I have to say. All right. We have a very quick little segment just because this is Easter week. And, and this I is wanted... yours, Rebecca, right? It is this mine. Is yeah. Spirit. I just want to you know Aaron... last Sunday was Palm Sunday. Last but who knew that, right? What oh, Zana, hey, Zana, 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 ho. <laughs> what Mormon even knows what Palm Sunday is? And that's what we're going to talk about. Because in my generation, I'm going to say that a lot today. <laughs> in this segment. Okay. So this is my slide. <laughs> Haven't we always celebrated Easter? This is what I'm hearing from everybody, but we haven't always celebrated Easter as members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, not in the way that we were being told to celebrate it in the last couple of years with the conference talks. There was one where they said this should be as big as Christmas. Um, in my day, I'll say it, Easter, we didn't know what Palm Sunday was. We didn't know what Holy Week was. In fact, in my family, I will say, my mom would say things like, well, that's kind of what the Christians do. You know, I knew what she meant. It, we did not do that. We were more reserved and solemn and we had our regular sacrament meeting and we did not celebrate Easter in this way. But things are changing, I feel, and I'm just kind of taking note. And here is an article. I think this is just so funny. It was a survey taken 10 years ago of LDS members, and they flat out said, this is a BYU survey, Easter is not important to Mormons. And of course, the meme says we're hollow inside or something like a chocolate bunny, but it isn't important. They didn't see it really different than any other day. They didn't expect any other meeting than their normal sacrament meeting. Easter was not important to Mormons, not like it is now. And I think maybe we should talk about why they, that may be that Easter, let's make Easter new again, right? Something like that. Let's so, make Easter great again. Let's make Easter great again. So you've probably seen these. I've been collecting them. I mean... Okay, we have signs in the in the front lawn of LDS church buildings saying, celebrate Palm Sunday with us, or he is risen, come to our worship service. I, <laughs> Landon, my co-host, was telling me he was driving somewhere with his daughter, who's in her 30s or late 20s, and she saw one of those signs, and she's been out of the church for a while, I think, and she said, what is that? I mean, it really stands out. These signs did not exist a couple years ago. And the idea that an LDS service would be some kind of a special Easter service is really pushing it a little bit, I think. There are articles, there are books all about how we can now celebrate Easter. There's Holy Week Easter egg hunt. I'm not sure exactly what that would be. Uh, we also see members uh, wearing crosses where we never saw that before. So have you guys noticed this phenomenon about Easter and Mormons acting like they really know how to do Easter? I've heard about it here and there, but you have a great collection and a great nose for news, Rebecca. Nose for news. Well, I do live in Utah County. I mean, if you're going to see it, you're going to see it here. Have you seen anything like this where you are, Bill? Because you are in Utah. I've just heard the church talk about this a little bit over the last few years. Yeah. I'm just wondering who in the church is qualified to do anything with Palm Sunday. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's not a church leader. Nope. <laughs> It's, it's ridiculous to pretend like more, the Mormon chapel is the place to go for yeah. Palm Sunday. Yeah, and that's, that's the problem I have with these signs is that someone will drive by and go, oh, it's an Easter service. We'll, we'll you know, we'll step in. And yeah. then when they sit down, they'll hear about Joseph Smith the entire time. So, yeah. yes, I understand they're trying, but I don't think they're equipped yet to do Easter like some of these other denominations. So, the, go ahead. The LDS church meetings are so sterile. They have no idea what is done in other churches. Yes. Because they stay away from them dutifully yep. and attend only the LDS church meetings. Yep. So when you have a Sunday meeting, which Easter's always on, and you always go to church and you have a regular meeting where maybe you've got all the kids together who've been practicing for, you know, goodness only knows how long to get up there and sing their little Easter songs and then have one of them say a scripture and then there's another yep. song. You might have something special like that, but it's still, just an Easter 
church service. Right. There's nothing that the much broader Christian world views as Easter and Holy Week and right. Palm Sunday and Monday, Thursday, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And Good Friday. Yep. And the entire week, which actually is just the culmination of Lent. Yep. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And again, we don't know anything about it. We really don't. We're trying. We're playing catch up, which are these books and these articles, but we really don't know anything about it. And as I looked around social media, I saw people because it was Palm Sunday last Sunday and people had attended other denominations and these wonderful services where they read scriptures, they had ceremonies with palms, they had incredible music, you know, and then to go to an LDS church where there's a sign outside that says, join us for Palm Sunday. There's nothing. Um, I also noticed there's kind of this uptick in Easter and Holy Week and Palm Sunday products being sold um, from LDS, you know, like Deseret Book and stuff like that. Um, this little, they, this one in the middle, it's it, they call it a crash, which it's not because that's a manger scene, but it is, it's the tomb. It's a couple figures dragging a cross around. I, okay, I'm very passive aggressive. I really thought about getting this for my mom because she would blow her. I mean, you know, we're talking someone who was raised in a certain church in the 80s. This is not what you display in your home. So I'm not going to get it for my mom, but it did cross my mind. <laughs> so you've got, you've got Holy Week cards. You've got little scenes of, uh, you know, the resurrection. It's just very different. And I think what I, I actually applaud them for trying to go this direction. I think this is very exciting. It makes, makes everything much more rich and meaningful this time of year. But to pretend and to gaslight us that we've always celebrated it, we have not always celebrated it. And we're just barely starting with baby steps. We do not know. We're probably not ready for guests yet, right? No, probably not, not ready. ready. For prime time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It looks like Holy Week is good for business. You know, I had a Catholic attorney friend who, uh, you know, he was pretty lapsed, but I asked him once when Lent was coming along, I said, what are you going to give up for Lent, Tom? And he looked at me and he said, sobriety. <laughs> I love it. He has the right point of view. So here's one of my favorite items that I've seen for sale. Like I said, Mormons are starting to wear crosses. I have seen more of acceptance there, but still I don't see it really sold at, at church stores like Desert Book or something. So they have something that is called the empty tomb. Okay. So it's an empty tomb necklace. You can see oh, it there. A and like a time, yeah, a I'm going to get one for each of you guys. I think for Easter, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll mail it. How but do you even know what first... that is looking at? Well, it? Okay. it looks like the but, opening of the twilight zone. Yeah. When I first saw it, it, I really thought, <laughs> I really Sorry, thought it was a taco, honestly. And then I thought maybe it's something like we're all an empty shell without Jesus. I mean, could it be something like that? <laughs> then of course I, I know I'm being facetious, but, but again, you know, they are trying to mark the resurrection, which is something we really didn't ever do before. And they have these wonderful empty tomb necklaces. So, mm -hmm. and tie tag. It's not too late to get one for your relative for Christmas. Do you have the Easter. one that where you made it look like a taco and you had the filling inside of it? Do you know, I did do that, but we don't need to tell everybody how evil I am that I actually did put a taco there. Yeah, we're it not. It looked delicious. Taco. It did look delicious. It did. So then I started it made me to want think, to go back to church. <laughs> then I started to think as Mormons do, they tend to embrace things full force, right? So I see this Easter momentum rolling year by year. It's getting stronger and stronger. So I wonder... Will there someday be an Easter trek? I found this online. It's actually on TikTok. And this looks like two men, almost a father and son. And they are taking Easter to the next level. They are dragging crosses across the beach and they're meeting people and they're handing out, you know, pass along cards about Christianity. So I wonder, do you think that the church would ever get on board with that? An Easter trek, maybe. If they're you look, cheating though. You get, you're well, putting wheels on. You got to drag this they're thing cheating. like Jesus yes. did. Yes. I was going to say, if you look closely, there is a wheel on the cross. <laughs> Cheaters. Well, I think they started That's on the Eastern like. Seaboard and this is around San Diego somewhere. It is. There's you a need wheel a wheel to drag ground. it across the country. Oh my gosh. And so I have seen someone dra dragging a cross. I went to the pride parade last summer and we sat at the very end, the very, very end. And at the end of the parade, there was a man dragging a cross. There was no wheel. It was a huge cross, even bigger mm -hmm. than this. And we practically had to revive him with water. He looked like he was about to die. He was doing it the right way dragging the cross through the pride, the pride parade. So anyway, this it's is one of those things of... that sounds like a good idea, but a hundred yards later, <laughs> you wish you hadn't, but everybody's watching now.
he was suffering for his point of view. That's for sure. So, okay. So then I still, the idea that they're trying to tell us that we've always done this, I decided to go on the church website itself to the topics and questions section, just to see what the church is now saying about the cross or about all of these celebrations. So I'm just going to read this. This is there now today um, on the website, the cross. The cross is used in many Christian churches as a symbol of the Savior's death and resurrection and as a sincere expression of faith. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we also remember with reverence the suffering of the Savior. But because the Savior lives, we do not use the symbol of his death as the symbol of our faith. So it says right there, we don't use crosses. And it right also there. implies that all other Christians don't believe that Jesus lives. Exactly. That's it. So interesting because I had, you know, the cross is more and more accepted everywhere. And you saw that little scene where he's dragging his cross that you can set up on your mantle. Okay, let's find out how they feel about Easter and all the things that go around it. Uh, Latter day Saints conduct Easter Sunday services, but do not follow, do not follow the religious observations of Ash Wednesday, Lent, or Holy Week. Well, now that's interesting because I saw quite a number of signs outside of buildings saying that they did, but this is on the church's website. As of today, you say? As of today. Hmm. As I printed it out today, yes. Um, they say, let's see, Latter-day Saint Easter services traditionally review New Testament and Book of Mormon accounts of Christ's crucifixion, his resurrection, and surrounding events. So again, they don't go into the scriptures and read about what happened during Holy Week or anything like that. For these services, chapels are often decorated with white lilies and other symbols of life. Word choirs frequently present Easter cantatas and congregations sing Easter hymns. As at services on other Sundays, the emblems of the sacrament are passed to the congregation. But it clearly says we do not celebrate Ash Wednesday, Lent, or Holy Week. So I think they're going to have to update that because I feel that they are trying to appear more Christian um, and be a part of the Christian community at large. And there are different reasons um, that we can probably talk about when we have more time of why they would want to do this. But they're definitely moving forward on appearing more Christian and celebrating Easter, which I actually think is a good thing. So what are your final thoughts on that? Speaking for people who were Mormons back in 1978 mm -hmm. and around those times, yeah. this is what we were taught led to the apostasy, yes. apostasy of Christianity, Yep, was adopting these pagan traditions yep. of Easter and all these things like Lent and, you know, all these things. That's why we eschewed them. We said, we're not part of that because we are pure and undefiled and restored truth of Christianity. But it looks like it was just too much fun to resist. <laughs> with, with this much power and authority, who needs to celebrate Holy Week anyway? Yeah. I don't know. There's a whole cottage industry building up around it, though. I mean, you can't believe how many products I found uh, for Mormons on Etsy and, and Desert Book to help celebrate Easter now. Yeah. A lot. Hey, RFM, before you close out, I just want to note really quick, uh, Thedius J. Whoopi, $9.99, $9.99 donated. Whoopi! Thedius J. Whoopi, $4.99. Gali Sinatra. Sinatra, I love that Not name. to be confused with Sinista. That was another person we had a conversation with. So Gail Sinatra, 20, but $20. Um, we've got Kenny B with a $5 super sticker. Yeah, Edie is Jay Whoopi again, $9.99. Double Whoopi. And Kenny B, a $10 super Ooh, sticker. So Kenny B. thank you to the super chats. Kenny B, wasn't he like a, a saxophonist back in the 70s? Is that Kenny G? I can't remember. Anyway, anyway, we are getting ready. Was it, was it a, I can't remember. It was, it was a soprano sax. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Energy. yeah. Okay. So, everybody, we're going to close out. But before we do that, we're going to do a little bit of a round robin, starting with Rebecca, about what is uh, happening this week, what we've got going on, what's going to be coming out shortly. Rebecca, please lead us off. Yes, this is great. So, I will say that on Mormonish Podcast, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, we have a, a live, a premiere. We have um, an update on another temple scenario that has happened right now. If anybody knows Mormonish, you know that we cover the Heber temple and we cover the Cody temple as far as citizens groups that are trying to get the temple perhaps relocated and kind of call the church on how they're changing zoning. There's a new temple in Las Vegas, the Lone Mountain Temple. And I encourage you guys to watch our broadcast. You will not believe 
what we have uncovered about what is happening as far as what the LDS Church is doing in this area to make sure that that temple is going to be built. This is going to be big. So that's what we're doing. Also, I think later tonight, I am on Mormon movie reviews. We're reviewing, um, oh my gosh, something about the angels. I can't remember an old movie, so that'll be fun. But anyway, yeah, we're just kind of doing our thing. We're what no angels. Doing? No, uh, how near the angels? No, how high the angels? How near the angels? Oh my gosh, I can't remember the name. It's because a great it's channel thing. <laughs> where they review old movies. You might remember old church movies and kind of do commentary like Mystery Science Theater called Mormon Movie Reviews. So check it out after this somewhere out there. All right, what's Bill doing? Well, um, I'll let RFM talk about uh, Mormonism Live this Wednesday if he wants to, but I think I'm pretty sure two Wednesdays from now, we will sit down with Rabbi Joe Charnas, Rabbi who, Joe. who was on Book of Mormon Central's oh. uh, video series, uh, A Marvelous Work, How Great the Evidence, <laughs> in which actor Scott Christopher, uh, that's his actor name. He has another name as his real life name, but he, he went under his actor name for this. I have another um, name other than RFM. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. Absolutely posited uh, tons of evidences for the Book of Mormon, which actually turn out to not be evidences as all, at all. And part of that plays into how they utilize Joe Charnas. And we will sit down with Joe, I think, in two weeks and have a conversation about uh, what his thoughts were about, around various aspects of that production. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Apparently, uh, Joe saw the rabbi, Rabbi Joe, saw the show and reached out to us and wanted to clarify a few things from his point of view that he thinks we got wrong. Uh -oh. And I'm looking forward to having a discussion with him because he seems like a guy with a lot of deep understanding. And um, I find such people always a delight and fascinating to talk with because I can learn a lot. Amen. Yeah. And tomorrow on Mormonism, not tomorrow, Wednesday on Mormonism Live, we're going to have a special guest on. We're going to talk about the latest attempt by uh, the LDS Church to defend its finances and its choice of what to do with its finances. This should be really good. This is going to be Spencer Anderson, oh, okay. I believe it is. Professor yeah, Spencer. he's a professor awesome. from, oh, geez, what is it he's now? In he, he's in Indiana now. Indiana now. Yeah, he's he moved Illinois to now Indiana. Indiana. Yeah. He's yeah. awesome. Right. He got run off the Illinois campus, but he secured a job <laughs> in Indiana. So he's still teaching. And this is going to be great. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Other than that, I've got Brush Up Your Shakespeare and Sunday School. They're back on track. I've been sick as a dog for the last 15 days or so, coming out of my stupor. Managed somehow, with your help, by the way, Bill and Rebecca, to be on the last two episodes, last two Mondays of Newscast, in spite of how I felt, and also on Mormonism Live. I made those the last two Wednesdays and uh, then crawled back into my sick bed. But, <laughs> but. I'm really, really excited. I'm feeling much better, feeling stronger every day, and looking forward to uh, just producing lots of high-quality content, as high-quality as I can possibly manage. Yeah. So with that said, let's round this out. Say good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us on the Mormon Newscast. Please join us next Monday, same bat time, same bat channel. That's 6 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time for the next episode of the Mormon newscast. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night.